Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Expert. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. So today I'm joined by Dr. Malcolm Bell, who you all know because he's one of our regular podcast co-hosts, and today he's going to be our expert. Malcolm is professor of medicine, and he's vice chair of the cardiovascular department and an interventional cardiologist here in Rochester. His areas of expertise and focus have, for a long time, been critical care cardiology and then acute coronary syndromes and then all of the things that go along with antithrombotic therapy and the complications. So that's what he's going to be talking about. And in particular, Dr. Bell, who I'd love to welcome you here. Thank you for inviting me and happy to join you today, Sharon. So he's going to be discussing the rationale for shortening the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy after coronary stenting and continuing P2Y12 inhibitor in preference to continuing aspirin. And obviously, you know, from a practice standpoint, the potential benefits might include a reduced risk of significant bleeding without increasing ischemic or thrombotic events. So this is a particularly attractive thing for many of the patients I care for who have multiple comorbidities and needs for procedures. So Malcolm, we know that patients undergoing coronary stenting require dual antiplatelet therapy for varying durations. And recently we've been hearing about some changes that might lead to changes in the use of dual therapy. What's new? Give us some context. Well, Sharon, I think, uh, first of all, I think you've already um, laid the, the groundwork with that uh, description of the, 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 uh, the, the needs and the, the risks of our patients. But, um, but maybe just allow me to, um, to highlight three things, which I think will just really give context to this uh, discussion. Uh, the first is that, uh, yes, bleeding uh, really is uh, an important thing for us to consider. You know, prior to the patient going into the cath lab, particularly in the acute coronary syndrome setting, uh, it's all about the ischemic risk. Following the procedure, it generally then becomes more about a bleeding risk. So that's something that uh, we, we just really need to focus on. Uh, the, the second thing is that there is no doubt that in the last few decades, we've seen significant improvements uh, in the uh, secondary prevention world. And I think you're particularly uh, with the use and the high use of uh, high dose, high potency statins. I think this has really changed the landscape. And the third thing is that stents, drug eluting stents, have got so much better. They're uh, uh, more effective than bare metal stents. They're safer. Um, and we should not see stent thrombosis rates like we saw before. And then in with current generation, second, third generation drug eluting stents, uh, we shouldn't expect to see stent thrombosis rates of, of more than 1%. And in many you know, trials, we can see that this is actually about half a percent. So uh, as you said, you know, there, there, there are some uh, changes. Uh, and the concept or the practice of what we call, say, short depth is becoming an increasingly popular strategy to try to decrease the risk of bleeding while at the same time uh, preserving the uh, the benefit in terms of preventing ischemic and uh, thrombotic uh, events. And so I think that as we think about short depth, what we're really talking about is are we we will be shortening the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy or DAPT, you know, for our uh, viewers and listeners, but also decreasing the intensity, and particularly at that point of instead of decreasing the intensity by discontinuing that P2Y12 inhibitor, so clopidogrel to carigrel or prasigrel, and in fact discontinuing aspirin, and then using the P2Y12 inhibitor as monotherapy. So that's what short depth. Is all about. So I love when I get a cath report or a sign out, a dismissal summary that gives me some direction as a non-invasive cardiologist who's going to be caring for these individuals. But I, I, you know, we're talking about dropping aspirin. We cardiologists love aspirin. Um, and I often get questions from our primary care colleagues. So this seems quite radical. And tell us why it's safe and why we drop the aspirin and, and not the uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. Yeah, well, absolutely. And no surprise that you get those questions or those um, reactions. There, aspirin is embedded in that mindset that this is the cornerstone of antiplatelet therapy of ischemic heart disease. And I think for good reason, you know, historically. 
But this has been challenged uh, more uh, recently, and there have been several trials, randomized trials, some of which were uh, blinded. Um, the majority, though, were open label, but very carefully done, large trials, um, looking at patients who've undergone PCI in various settings, with stable angina, or acute coronary syndromes, including STEMI, that have then shown that in a randomized fashion, that whether it's at one month or three months, that discontinuing the aspirin and continuing the uh, PGY12 inhibitor, so again, agents such as clopidogrel, actually results in significant benefits in terms of decreased risk of bleeding. But at the same time, with no penalty in terms of more ischemic or thrombotic uh, events. And I think it's really important for people to also appreciate that historically, when we first started doing, you know, using stents, there was no trial that showed that uh, continuing aspirin as monotherapy compared to a PGY12 inhibitor, the first one, of course, was clopidogrel, um, was any different because that, that trial just wasn't done. It was always dual therapy versus aspirin. And so what we're trying to get at here is if all the benefit or most of the benefit is with that PGY12 inhibitor, and aspirin is not adding anything to the benefit, which seems to be the signal from these trials, but only increasing the risk of bleeding, then we have to relook at this. And that was really the impetus for these trials. And all of those trials showed very consistent results, everything in the, right, in the same direction. And it doesn't surprise me entirely because I have patients who are just put on, you know, even for, for secondary prevention, not even after a stent, put on aspirin and they don't tolerate it from a GI standpoint. Um, and they seem to tolerate clopidogrel and the other medications much better. It, 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 the bleeding that we are preventing, is is it um, disproportionately GI or is it just all bleeding? So it, it, it's all bleeding, but you brought up a really um, good point with, uh, with your observation. And that is that uh, with uh, GI bleeding, so bleeding from, from the stomach, actually appears to be less with clopidogrel than it is with aspirin. And I think, you know, just a reminder to everyone, uh, you know, we should listen to what the surgeons tell us. And our patients, aspirin causes people to bleed. I mean, there is, there is no question. And we know also that in people who have uh, had stents, and particularly in the setting of non-STEMI and STEMI, if they have a bleed, particularly early on, that is associated with a higher short-term and long-term mortality risk. So we should never underestimate uh, the impact uh, of uh, bleeding in, in their patients. So when and in which patients do you switch to monotherapy with a PTY-12 inhibitor? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really uh, very good a, a practical question. And um, my colleagues and I you know, are starting to do a lot more of this in, in the last uh, year or so, but it's, you know, it hasn't been you know, universal. But I think that, as I said earlier, this is an increasingly popular strategy. I think the patients to start with uh, are those who are at high bleeding risk. And these were, uh, for some of these trials, actually were identified as high bleeding risk uh, patients. The uh, patient who's had an action will bleed. I mean, that person who had a bleed three or four weeks after the stands is placed. I mean, I, I think this becomes an easy decision. We've got really good data you know, to, to, to support that. And I think also just thinking about the types of patients that you're dealing with. So there are two distinct uh, uh, categories of patients. One is the patient who has stable angina, comes in, walks in, has an angiogram, has PCI, same day dismissal, stable ischemic heart disease. The prognosis and outcome in those patients is so much better than it is in the second category compared to the second category. These are the ones with the non stemmies and stemmies. So I think if people want to get comfortable with this, these are the patients, you know, the ones that we're seeing as an outpatient, these are the ones that we should probably uh, uh, target. But we still have patients. I mean, we see a lot of bleeding in our ACS patients, and you uh, alluded to it earlier, older patients, more comorbidities. It's not infrequent, and uh, very often your patients are coming back with bleeding uh, new complications. And in fact, our guidelines are really uh, up to date with this. And in the last couple of years, it's now a 2A recommendation that you can switch to uh, a monotherapy with a PGY12 inhibitor uh, after that uh, first uh, one to three months. And as I said, the patients I would start targeting uh, first would be the, those uh, high-risk uh, uh, patients for bleeding and an action will bleed. So 
But for acute coronary syndrome, though, isn't the recommendation still dual antiplatelet therapy for a year, even if they're not revascularized? Yeah, that's a, that's. A, thanks for bringing that up. So, um, as and just as an aside, you know, to again put context to this, stable angina. These are low risk patients, and so the guidelines are still there. Six months of dual antiplatelet therapy, but the guidelines have always stated, you know, that to continue for six months or twelve months, just as you said, for ACS patients, so the non-stemming stemmies, that's still the recommendation. Twelve months of dual antiplatelet therapy. But there was always a caveat, as long as the patient is not at increased risk of bleeding. And the patients who bled and then you felt that you had to stop something, it was usually the P2Y12 inhibitor. These trials, although they didn't compare it to aspirin alone, and that, I think that's something we need to, uh, uh, to look out for, these trials would really challenge that and say, instead of stopping the aspirin, you should stop the P2Y12 inhibitor. Uh, and so... The type of patients that you're seeing in your uh, clinic who may have had a you know, non-STEMI uh, a few weeks ago, we may say, you know, dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for one month, three months, but then we're going to switch to monotherapy for the P2Y12 inhibitor. And Ross, on, Ross, I'm on that. I, I think we have to be really cautious about stopping the P2Y12 inhibitor in those higher risk ACS patients within the first six months because we do not have any good safety data of using aspirin as monotherapy in those patients, if that makes sense. So do you have um, a preference or is it a patient match for particular P2Y12 inhibitors in this setting where you're thinking you may be stopping the aspirin? Yes, um, I, th I think it's important to point out that the trials which uh, you know, have been conducted um, probably two thirds of those were uh, with the use of clopidogrel. And some of our uh, listeners and viewers may say, well, that's sort of a weaker P2Y12 inhibitor. That's maybe not necessarily the case. And about a th uh, third of them were with ticagrelor. So I think either of those two agents, we don't have enough data with prasigrelor, but I suspect it would be the same uh, as we see with ticagrelor uh, and uh, clopidogrel. Um, in our practice, we have defaulted a number of years ago to using clopidogrel. Uh, uh, as our default P2Y12 inhibitor in all of our patients. And and, uh, and I know in other practices, they may be using uh, ticaricolor. There's really good data with ticaricolor to be used as monotherapy. So those are the two agents that uh, I would recommend, but uh, I'm not sure that we can say that Prasigrel would be or should or should not be used as monotherapy. So Malcolm, what I'm seeing is, so we do six, 12 months of monotherapy of, uh, say, clopidogrel, um, so we've done their their course. And what I I'm actually have done a few times and I'm seeing more commonly is not putting them back on aspirin, which I think is what we used to do, but just continuing the clopidogrel. What evidence is there for, for doing that? Um, and uh, what should we be thinking about in terms of making choices for those patients? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Sharon, because I think that while... Um, General cardiologists, primary care uh, you know, providers, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, et cetera, they may be sort of comfortable saying, okay, we're going to go with monotherapy for three months, six months, 12 months. But at 12 months, we're good. We, we know that patients should be on aspirin. And we, we know that we have data now showing that aspirin actually may actually cause more, more bleeding um, than, than uh, an agent such as clopidogrel. But we have really good data. If we go back almost three decades, the Capri trial, very large trial, about 20,000 patients, as I recall, they randomized patients with vascular disease, many of whom had uh, you know, coronary disease and had MIs and had, had uh, procedures. That wasn't sort of a stent population, but many of these patients uh, may well have uh, had stents. And they randomized patients to clopidogrel and aspirin. And these are stable patients and sort of long-term secondary uh, prevention. And as I said, it was double-blinded, a really well-done study. And it showed that clopidogrel was superior to aspirin in preventing ischemic and thrombotic events. And maybe unexpectedly for many uh, uh, of our viewers and listeners, there was no increased risk of major bleeding in the clopidogrel-treated patients. And in fact, it was the same with aspirin, you know, uh, compared to aspirin. So you got the benefit of uh, clopidogrel Without excess with risk. no excess of uh, bleeding. And I think yeah. that that was, and that's something that's probably going to take a while to get used to. 
but this is really what the challenge is, uh, I think. Um, but anyway, I, I hope that sort of answers your question there. But And I think that's very helpful, particularly when we have aspirin intolerant patients, aspirin allergy patients, where we may be used to where we worry that we weren't doing the right thing for them. And now we can, um, you know, I think be more comfortable with that. Yeah. And this, and this one, uh, uh, trial, it was a Korean study where, uh, you know, in stable patients after PCI and acute myocardial infarction in many of them, they again did a similar thing. It was open label, but they randomized patients to clopidogrel or aspirin. And uh, so no one on dual therapy at, you know, after six, 12 months or so. And they showed the same thing as in Capri, that clopidogrel actually prevented more events than aspirin did. But in this study, there was actually significantly less bleeding in the patients who uh, received clopidogrel versus aspirin. So I think this really challenges what our uh, belief about uh, the risk of bleeding is uh, with aspirin. Well, I think the other barrier that we've overcome is now that um, clopidogrel is so affordable. It is still prescription, but we are not, for those individuals who dropping any copay or or high drug cost it was is really important at that year and that often i think drove decisions and still does obviously yes. and and now um i'm seeing that there's less resistance from from that side yeah i mean it's, nothing's as cheap as uh, aspirin but uh, maybe all aspirin is doing is just increasing your risk of bleeding but you're absolutely right i mean uh, once uh, clopidogrel went uh, you know generic uh, this is really quite an affordable uh, drug uh, it's very interesting. We've talked about ticaribolor. I mean, the out-of-pocket ex- uh, cost for ticaribolor, depending on which state you're in, uh, you know, could be up to five hundred dollars a month. And uh, and we're talking about you know less than a hundred dollars for clopidogrel, and it's uh, actually not much more expensive for prasugrel, uh, by the way. Um, now, if you've got uh, you know good insurance, good copay, that's fine. But but someone's paying for this. You know, it's uh, it's your insurance company and your premiums and uh, and the government. We so, are, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think you know when, when you actually show those numbers in front of you, and well, of course you know we have patients who don't have you know good uh, pros, and to put them on a, an expensive agent up such as Tecaribol, or um, that's really a, a non-starter. I mean, they're going to be calling up very very quickly and wanting a, a cheaper agent. Right. Well, um, I'm just a really appreciative that my colleagues in the Mayo Clinic cath lab, after doing a procedure have been really good about specifying because we are more customizing this. I can see that. And it's, you know, and I know our primary care, they read the dismissal notes and they know what to do and they're getting used to it. So I'm I'm hoping that that practice of being mindful and individualizing, individualizing our recommendations, taking both bleeding and thrombotic risks and using the evidence that you've presented with us to us today, um, we'll just keep um, uh, it keep getting greater, and I'm hoping it's happening at other centers. Yeah, I mean, it'll be a slow seed change, but uh, I think people get more and more comfortable. And as I said, you know, all of the trial data results are very consistent in, in this direction. I just want to thank you, Malcolm, for trading seats yeah. and being in the expert seat today. It was really great to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, this wraps up this week's episode of Interviews with the Expert. Thank you, Dr. Bell, again for discussing this important topic. We look forward to you joining us again next week for another interview with the expert, maybe with Dr. Bell. Be well.